And I'm from the Baltimore Ecclesia. Uh, the accent is because I grew up in Australia. I'm from, from Adelaide. I grew up in uh, the Mount Barker Ecclesia in Adelaide. And it's great to be here with you all this morning. We have uh, an exciting class to look forward to from our brother Andy continuing the series uh, and looking this time at the theme of confidence. Just a couple of announcements. If you would like a hearing assistant, brother Dan at the back here has uh, one which you can just pop on your ear. Uh, if you have a child under 12, there is Sunday school happening in the gym uh, just out through the doors. Also out through those doors you see to the right is um, ladies bathroom and to the left is the men's. Well, our opening hymn, which is hymn 357, and sorry, we don't have a hymn announcement um, board, so you have to listen to me as I call out the hymns. Hymn 357 speaks to where that confidence comes from. And in verse 3, it says, Be prayerful, my brother, and look to your maker. He's promised to help you and waits for your call. Just tell him your trouble. He is the Almighty. There's nothing too big and there's nothing too small. Let's open through the words of hymn 357, followed by an opening prayer by our brother Gideon of the Baltimore Ecclesia, hymn 357. Wonderful and merciful creator, we come before you now this morning, very thankful for the confidence with which we can approach you. Lord, we thank you for bringing us all together here safely this morning so that we can share in this fellowship and to study your word and to glean lessons from it this morning. We ask that you bless our time together, that you be with those who may be traveling still, that you bring them here safely. We ask that you open our hearts so that we may be uh, attentive and and may glean lessons that um, we can apply in our lives going forward that we may be more like your son we ask that you be with those who aren't with us this morning that you watch over them and bless them as well we know their needs and we know lord that there are many who need your strength and your your comfort we ask that you be with each of them and, and that you continue to watch over them we ask that you bless our efforts this morning and that you keep us all safe and most of all we ask for your son's soon return we ask all this in his name amen So our brother Andy has asked as a reading to prepare for this session that we read uh, Hebrews 11. And we'll ask our brother Roberto from the Washington Ecclesia to come forward and read that for us. Thanks, Roberto.
Reading together from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. By faith Enoch was translated, that he should not see death, and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the sea shore innumerable. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is in heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received them in a figure. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hit three months of his parents, because they saw that he was a proper, a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured at seeing him who was invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David also, and Samuel, and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth, and these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, 
that they without us should not be made perfect. Thank you, Brother Roberto. Well, our brother Andy has been looking at this theme of spiritual lessons from sports, and we've looked at uh, self-discipline and preparation and teamwork yesterday, and this morning we look forward to the thoughts he's prepared on confidence. Thanks, Brother Andy. Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends. Uh, thank you, Dan and Roberto, for getting us ready for this last session together. As Dan referenced, we spent yesterday at the Moorestown Hall looking at spiritual lessons for sports. And it's something that I feel it speaks to my personal experience, but I want to make this accessible to everyone. And so we've used these experiences of sports competition and spiritual lessons but we've tried to apply them to let things that we see in scripture. It's not layering uh, the names of the Lord onto things that are unimportant in life, but rather saying anything that we do has to reflect something that we can improve about ourselves when we go to the Bible. And in particular, we focused on the challenge of self-improvement and the mindset that is required of athletes. Anyone who has to compete has to learn how to sacrifice and prepare. And sports offers a very physical, tangible representation of these attributes. And they can be applied in many aspects of life. That's one of the things that I do appreciate about sports, is that it's a way to see something in action when you literally sweat and push your body that you can say then when there's a problem in your family or in your work or in our ecclesia that, okay, well, I can handle this, or I have a path to making something better. Now, we started yesterday by considering the individual attributes of self-discipline and preparation, and then we concluded in our sessions yesterday by looking at principles of teamwork that illustrate our shared experiences as believers, including the ideas of unity, diversity, and love. Now, for this morning, We'd like to now build on those principles to consider how we can put them all together in performance. And we begin with this idea of confidence. And the confidence of God is integral to our self-belief. It's one thing to understand the information in the scriptures. It's another thing to have it connect from that information to the way we actually, at the deepest part of our identity, are motivated. And living by that confidence is a choice made by disciples. We'll also recognize that there is some measure of self-confidence that is important in meeting life's challenges. We can't go through life without some sense of like, well, I can do this. Otherwise, we would never get out of bed. We would never have a job. We would never have a family. We have to have some confidence in what we can actually do. We just can't depend on that solely in our lives because we recognize that just like the disciples, preparation and learning to work together, gaining confidence happens over time, and it's ultimately confidence in our Lord. But we also must then set goals and look ahead in our lives with purpose. We will, have, we will understand that confidence is evidenced most in action. So again, that's one of these topics that we can talk about, but we have to recognize what it means when we live. And last, an idea that we'll look at this morning is that our faithful actions can influence others. I think that's a recurring theme of many of the topics we touched on yesterday is that we have to concentrate on ourselves in a healthy manner, but by doing that, it's also those lessons that we put them into practice are reflected in our relationships. And so often the Lord will look at us and say, are we meeting our potential by how we are assisting other people? How we are helping them to progress in their lives as disciples. So, let's start by reading a passage that was one of our key ver uh, references yesterday several times. We'll have a slightly different emphasis this morning. 1 Corinthians 9, beginning at verse 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. 
And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Now in some of our topics that we investigated yesterday, we talked about like we are very purposeful, but there is, there is one prize. We are seeking eternal life. To have that goal in, the, in our sights, even though we have individual steps in our lives to make to progress towards that goal. And we also have to be disciplined. We have to learn how to behave, how to be ready to meet that goal. But let's also consider from verse 26. Therefore I run, thus not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. I don't run aimlessly. I don't waste motion. I am, again, purposeful in my actions, and I have to be very directed. And I believe it takes confidence to continue with that purposeful approach to life and to discipleship. There's a quote here from Carl Lewis, great Olympic athlete. If you don't have confidence, you'll always find a way not to win. We have to look for the positive, not the negative. And Carl Lewis is interesting. Uh, Carl Lewis actually grew up and went to high school about 15 minutes from here in Willingboro, New Jersey. So this idea of like, believing not just in yourself to, in a healthy manner, but believing in what you're going for, that that is worth maintaining that motivation and interest throughout your life. Now, to be the best versions of ourselves, we must have confidence. And this is not a misguided belief in our own strength. This is, Bible believers, we most often call this faith. Brother Roberto read for us, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, one of the most, I believe, referenced passages of Scripture in our community of believers. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith can mean many things to us, and it's not simple in the, that you just define with a few words, like you're looking up an entry in a dictionary. But I suggest that we consider this definition for today's consideration. That faith is confidence in God when we do not or should not have confidence in ourselves. Faith is the ability to, to understand what I don't know, God knows. What I can't do, God can do. And it will allow you to proceed even when you are uncertain of your own abilities because you trust that the Lord will be there for you. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 6 reads, So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. We walk by faith, not by sight. Our discipleship is not transactional. We don't do things just because what we expect to get immediately, neither from the Lord nor from those that we share this experience with. We are motivated by things that are not by themselves tangible. You can't take faith and put it on the shelf and then take it out and like, okay, I got to look up, you got to get my little bit of faith this morning. But that confidence, just as it, anything that you have experienced in your life that you're very good at, and you then you think, well, I can do that now. Well, faith you know, builds over the course of time. Our relationship with God, our understanding of what discipleship is, gives us confidence to keep moving forward. And to live by confidence in God's promises is a decision that we make. In part, it's a decision that we made when we were baptized, but we all know when we were baptized, that's just the beginning of a journey. We don't have a full appreciation for life's challenges. We don't always have a full understanding of what God's promises are actually going to mean in my life. And that's okay. That's the way it should be. You continue learning. You continue growing and maturing. But we've made a choice that that's where we're going, and that confidence is an important part of what carries us on that road. Like other men and women before us, we should be motivated by faith. Again, our brother read an entire chapter that uses examples of people. Just the beauty of Scripture sometimes is not just information like you were taking a college course and say like, okay, this principle, you have to see it. It's like, well, you know what? It's best understood when you look at the life of someone, decisions that they made, mistakes that they made, so that you can perhaps see something that's happening in your own life and use that to make your choice. Hebrews chapter 11 at verse 13, the portion 
about the faith of the patriarchs. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They not only understood that faith was a motivating force in their lives, but they, they had this great depth of belief and confidence and trust that God was there for them, and they embraced it as a process. We talked yesterday, and we will today, like, all these issues is, or attributes as disciples, they evolve and they develop. It's a process, we have to recognize that. No, no one success is permanent, no one failure is crushing. We learn from these experiences. Basketball star Steph Curry has this quote, success is not an accident, success is actually a choice. Again, we have chosen to find confidence in God. We have chosen to say that as much as I might believe in myself about something, there is something greater that will change this world, and I can be part of that. Now, confidence helps us with life's challenges. Another great athlete, one of the greatest athletes of the 20th century was the boxer, Muhammad Ali. And he says that the lack of faith, it's the lack of faith that makes people afraid of meeting challenges, and I believe in myself. Now, as disciples, there, there is some validity to that. The only thing is it has to come in context of our belief and confidence in God. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 reads, Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So it's not, a, if, if we were merely self-centered and believed that we could control everything, that would be insufficient. But if we believe that we are capable of achieving things in life because of the context of the scriptures, and the ongoing process of learning and development that develop faith in us, then we should be able to handle life's difficulties. The just live by this confidence and trust. So it's ultimately, our confidence must be in God, not ourselves. However, we must develop the inner strength to demonstrate our faith in living. And we gain confidence through experience. There's no substitute. You can't jump from... I'm baptized and I know everything and I can do faith in all of my life. It's just, it's never happened for any person ever. And building our faith is part of the disciple's self-improvement process, along with qualities such as discipline and preparation and, and understanding how we actually work together and what our relationship should be in the ecclesia. Now, building faith as part of this process is well described in Romans chapter 5. Beginning at the first verse, and I know we looked at this yesterday with different points of emphasis on the love of God. Now we're going to look at it thinking about how faith is part of this ongoing development process. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To being part of the confidence and trust of God through whom we also have access by faith into this grace which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also know but we also glory in tribulations. We recognize that problems, while they are not enjoyable in the moment, that we can reflect back on them and recognize that they are what are teaching us. It's part of God's method to have men and women improve themselves in their faith and in their preparation for his kingdom. Knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So our faith is built and forged by some of the more difficult experiences that we have in life. We should not treat them as being a final outcome. The great athlete Michael Jordan noted that I failed over and over again, and in my life, that is why I succeed. You know, one of the mind, you know, one of the important parts of some great competitors is that they don't see any one failure, loss, setback, injury as defining them. More often than not, they use it as fuel and motivation for doing something greater later, for moving on in their lives. So we learn from past experience. Quite often, in fact, we learn more 
from our mistakes and disappointments than we do from our successes. This human psyche is such that we become complacent and comfortable, especially when things are going well. But when something's a struggle, we can reflect upon who we are. We can reflect upon our relationship with the Lord. And we can consider more intently what we should be doing differently. So based upon those experiences, a disciple matures and gains strength. The great tennis player, Serena Williams, made this comment, I've grown most from victories. I've grown most not from victories, but from setbacks. If winning is God's reward, then losing is how he teaches us. Again, it's easier to talk about this on a Sunday morning in May than it is to actually do it when something really bad happens. But the more we have a thought that this is the way I'm going to approach life, the more prepared you are to handle difficulty. The more prepared you are to be a good example to people in your family, in your ecclesia, and say, okay, it's hard, but this is what we're gonna do. Instead of being paralyzed by fear and uncertainty. Because our trust, is, when we don't know what to do, we have trust in God. That doesn't mean we get an answer delivered to us exactly what we need to do next. And we'll talk in our exhortation about some of the qualities we need to have to approach difficult circumstances. But we also need to know that we're going to learn from it. And we're going to get better because of that. And we need to continue to push forward in life. So although we learn from the past, we can't live in the past. Philippians chapter 3, beginning of verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do, do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This is an attitude that any you know, seasoned and experienced competitor has to have. You, no matter who you are, no matter how successful you've been, you are going to make errors. You're going to find that you've made a mistake in your life, or you're going to find that something just by, as we talked about yesterday, time and chance just did not favor you. You forget about it. That doesn't mean you forget the lesson, but you forget the feeling. You forget the emotion, and you move forward because what we have as a prize is so valued that we cannot afford to lose sight of it. And we press forward to using the example of Jesus Christ and the principles that we learn in Scripture. We're encouraged to maintain our focus on our work as disciples. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25 and 26 read, Let your eyes look straight ahead and your eyelids look right behind you, uh, before you. Ponder the path of your feet and let all your ways be established. Staying straight on your path towards that kingdom, not being distracted, not looking backwards, but always looking forward is part of evidencing your faith and that confidence in God. Now, here's a photo that's one of the more iconic sports photos of the 20th century. So surely someone here knows who was the first man to run a mile under four minutes. Someone from England know? No. No? It's a man named Roger Bannister, and he's, he's the man to the left of this photo. And it is actually almost exactly 70 years ago. It was May 6th, 1954, that Roger Bannister in Oxford, England, ran a mile under four minutes. Many people who have some general familiarity with sports might know that, but many people don't know who was the second man to run the mile under four minutes. It was the man to the right in this photo, John Landy, who's from Australia. He actually ran faster than Roger Bannister a month later, in June of 1954. And then they had a much uh, hyped match race in the Commonwealth Games in Vancouver, Canada at the end of that summer. I believe it was August of 1954. And it became the race that the first time that two men in the same race ran a mile under four minutes. Now, John Landy was a man who by his personality uh, and his 
focus as an athlete. He wanted to run the perfect race. He was very interested in time. And he went out in that race quickly and set the standard from the first lap. Roger Bannister, although he was the first man under four minutes, he was more concerned with winning. Not necessarily what his final time was, was just being ahead of everyone else on that day. And as they went into the last turn of the race, John Landy, who had been out in front the entire time, turned his head to the inside, trying to gauge where Roger Bannister was. And at that same moment, Roger Bannister was passing him on his outside shoulder. And Roger Bannister won that race. Now, it's, the, the result of their competition isn't as relevant for our conversation, but this, just this idea of don't look back at what's happened before. Focus on what you're doing. Again, in a healthy, constructive way. And in fact, this, this image, actually, there's a statue of these two men with this exact moment depicted in Vancouver at the stadium where the race took place. So it's important that we, what we, I use this as a visual to help us to recall that it's important that we not live with regret. We don't long for something that's gone or become too easily distracted from our work as disciples of Jesus. I mean, that can happen to all of us. I've, I've fallen prey to that, where I, some disappointment, some opportunity that I had longed for, it didn't come my way. Well, stop dwelling on it. Do something else. The Lord is providing so many opportunities for you in life. Don't feel that you are held back by something that didn't happen the way you imagined or had hoped for. We're not to turn back from our commitment to God's purpose. Jesus makes mention of this in the Gospels. In Luke 17, he even talks about remember Lot's wife when he references the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah and people who could look back to a different kind of life when that life was never worth having in the first place. In fact, we're expected to look ahead, motivated by the hope represented by the Lord's promises. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, Paul writes to Timothy and to the first century ecclesiastes, telling them to pursue things that are not easily seen. But you, O man of God, in verse 11, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life, to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Pursue, we're, we're not just to, to learn things, we're to go after them, we're to chase them. We see something that's positive, we're to fill up our lives with that activity. We're to pursue things like our confidence and understanding God's plan. We're to live prepared to overcome adversity and any concern that could hold us back from our goal. 2 Corinthians 4, reading from verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. We're not to give up. Because what we are looking for, what we believe God will prepare for us, is eternal. It is greater than any imaginable goal that we could have in this life. So that should be something that we, we don't lose sight of, that is never far from away from us, even when we are naturally and understandably concerned with our jobs, our finances, our families, perhaps our school, perhaps who are we going to have as a relationship with in our lives. All those things are real. I don't mean to ever dismiss our problems. But it's just we have to have the capacity to look past our problems and say, I can get through this. It will be temporary. It won't define me. And I trust in God to help me with that. Now, confidence comes from performance, though. We can, we can talk about it. You have to actually do it. Football coach Bill Parcell said, confidence is only born out of one thing, demonstrated ability. It's not born out of anything else. You cannot dream up confidence. You cannot fabricate it. You cannot wish it. You have to accomplish it. 
In other words, if you're confident in yourself, you're confident in God, then act like it. Make a choice and stick with it. Something happens, don't let it destroy you. Don't let it shake you. Say, okay, all right, well, what are we going to do now? James chapter 2. But some will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You see then, later in verse 24, that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. So often we as in our community will talk about this, these ideas of faith and works. Again, they are separate ideas, but they are joined together. If you have confidence in God, you do good things with it. If you have confidence in God, you evidence it in the choices that you make. You can't have confidence and still make the same mistake over and over again. Fall into the same traps of sin and weakness. And we all have it, but our faith and our effort to embrace this process of self-improvement and discipleship means that we are going to reflect upon these issues and these experiences. And we're going to try and do something differently next time. So confidence, faith, means action. If we are motivated by our belief, then we must evidence that confidence in the way we choose to live. And confidence influences others. Football coach Vince Lombardi, who's maybe the originator of all these little sayings and phrases that many coaches use, said, confidence is contagious, so is the lack of confidence. And when you're, I've seen this at work. When you have a good manager who builds people up, who checks in with them, who communicates well, creates confidence in what you're doing, and then the person in the office next to you feels the same way, it really makes a difference in productivity and attitude. In our ecclesia, when we show faith, when we evidence love and an attitude of mutual concern and interest, those things, they build momentum. We can shape and influence each other. Even when we're not necessarily intend to, we're not doing it always purposefully, but just if you live with faith and confidence, somebody else is going to see that. When you have some difficulty that befalls you individually or your family, and you handle it with grace and confidence, and you say, okay, well, we're dealing with it. And other people know that. And then when they have a problem, they're like, they may be unconsciously like, well, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, you know what? Maybe I can do that too. Or maybe they'll talk to you and ask you how, that, how, how did you approach it. We can help each other by evidencing confidence in God in the way we project ourselves in the ecclesia. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And then he echoes the quote in Habakkuk that we looked at a little bit earlier in our session. Or in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We learn also about faith from other people. And I would imagine that most, if not everyone here who's been in a a baptized member of an ecclesia or grew up in an ecclesia, you, know, you can think about people that maybe some who are here in this room, some of which who are not here or some who have, who have passed on, that you can draw motivation from, that you learn from. You appreciate the way they lived and think, you know, how, how can I use that example? And certainly we use that with scripture. And you know, our brother read for us Hebrews 11, Go back and read that chapter in this context later. And think about the example of those individual men and women of faith, things that they accomplished. And I don't think Hebrews 11 is meant to be a comprehensive inclusion of all the men and women of Scripture who, who evidence this trust and confidence in God. But it's a great way to start to think about how do we do it ourselves. And if we can influence others, and, and we therefore can influence others through our examples of faith. So confidence is really faith. And faith has 
many different ideas associated with it, but I would suggest to you, when it comes to the simplest and most direct way of thinking about it that will assist us as disciples, it's confidence in God. When we do not, because of our own experience, our own personality, have the confidence that we require, we're sometimes when we need to be humbled and say, you know what, maybe I didn't have all the answers and I should not have confidence in myself, so I'm going to trust in God. And we should have this great confidence. Romans 8, we also looked at briefly yesterday with emphasis on the idea of all things, that there's nothing left out. But now think about this entire phrase. Romans 8, verse 26, or 28 rather, and we know all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Nothing left out, everything in our lives. At some point, we'll work together in the manner in which God will have us you know, be best for our experience. We should be confident in that. Basketball coach John Wooden, again, a very, very smart teacher who had a gift for making concise but insightful phrases for people to remember. He said, things work out best for those who work, make the best of the way things work out. Having an accepting attitude doesn't mean you don't stop working hard to change or improve, but you also don't become completely destroyed and derailed by something that didn't come to fruition the way you had hoped. It's, it, it's really, you know, it's something that I've found helpful. It's, it's, only, it's the only quote non-scriptural that I've actually written in my Bible. I have that by Hebrews chapter 11. Things work out best for those who make the best of the way things work out. And I think there are a lot of the men and women recorded in that chapter that had a similar attitude. Things were hard, we figured it out. We worked with it. Because our trust is in God, not what's going to happen today, but it's what God is going to do for us in the future. Later in the same chapter, Romans 8, 31, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? We believe in the creator of life. We believe that that creator, even with that awesome, almost unimaginable power, still cares about me and you. There should be great confidence that if the creator cares about me, I can do anything that I need to do in this life. And we will read Romans 8 and build upon that in the word of exhortation. So a few ideas to remember from our time this morning. Faith is another way to refer to our confidence in God. Our faith in God provides a start for developing self-confidence so that we can meet life's challenges. We gain confidence through experience. The most hard-earned lessons, however, are also the most impactful. We should not look back. Look forward with purpose. Don't worry about the disappointment or the mistake in, that happened in the past. Be ready for the next opportunity. Confidence is based on a demonstrated ability. Our faith must be evidenced in our choices. You can't just talk about it, you actually have to do it. Faithful actions can influence others. I mean, you're dealing with your problem, but the way you respond you might find actually provide help for someone else, even when you didn't realize it. And lastly, we should draw confidence from the knowledge that God is working with each one of us every day. Not everyone can say that. Not everyone has come to that understanding. Not everyone goes to the scripture looking for, these, in for this understanding. We do. It should be a source of great confidence. Thank you for listening this morning. On well, behalf of you all, thanks, Brother Andy, for those very encouraging words. Our closing hymn uh, is hymn 345. 345 echoes a lot of the themes that we've explored uh, today. Fight the good fight with all thy might. And we'll follow this if you remain standing uh, through prayer, uh, which I'll give. Hymn 345.
Let's pray. Father, creator, father of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, of, of that great cloud of witnesses we reflected on in Hebrews 11, those men and women of old. And as our brother Andy reminded us, father of those who we draw motivation from, the many brothers and sisters who have contributed to each of our own ecclesias. We're so grateful for their examples, many, many of whom are no longer with us and sleep in hope of the joy that is set before them. Bring that day soon, we pray. And for all of those who are suffering, suffering mortality, its, it's cruel effects, we pray for them right now, right across the brotherhood, that they may have confidence not looking backwards, always looking forward to the joy that is set before them. For those, Heavenly Father, who are suffering in other ways, perhaps suffering from mental health challenges, we know there are many amongst us, we pray for them. We know there are many more who could be here with us today. We pray that you would renew their confidence, their faith, that you would strengthen their faith, that you would help us to help them. Father, we all long to be there in that day, and it's through that coming King we pray, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.